Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. If you're a regular viewer of the channel, then you might remember that a few months back, we brought you a list of crime stories where suspects were hit with an instant dose of karma. As we often do when we make lists like this, we came across way more cases than we could fit into a single video, and we asked you at the end if you'd like to see more in a future release. The answer was a pretty resounding yes, so this week we decided to revisit the topic. Just before we get to today's stories, a reminder that if you find our videos interesting and informative, to like and subscribe for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, here are 10 more criminals who were hit with instant karma. Generally speaking, perseverance is an admirable quality to possess. Ask any successful person how they got to where they are, and they'll almost always tell you that they encountered a lot of hardship and failure along the way. Of course, despite the countless uplifting slogans out there about never giving up, under certain circumstances, there's something to be said about knowing when to quit, especially when the dreams you're trying to achieve aren't exactly legal. This is precisely what happened on the afternoon of April 20th, 2012, when a 39-year-old man named Robert Strank walked into a branch of the Huntington Bank in the city of Beaver Creek, Ohio, with the alleged intentions of robbing the place. Unfortunately for Strank, things went south almost immediately, and before he could put his plan into action, he started to suffer some sort of medical emergency. He managed to make it to the counter and inform the teller about what was going on, before he abruptly fainted and fell to the floor. By the time Strank came to, bank staff had already called 911, and an ambulance was on its way. Despite being informed of this, the 39-year-old reportedly decided that his mission was still totally salvageable. It was at this point that he handed the teller who he had just collapsed in front of a note demanding that they hand over all of the bank's cash. Understandably, no one at the bank was particularly threatened by Strank's note given the circumstances, and he did not get the money that he was there for. Instead, he was checked out by paramedics at the scene before being turned over to police, who promptly charged him with attempted robbery. While we unfortunately were not able to find out what ultimately happened to Strank, reports from the Times stated that this was far from his first brush with the law. He had previous robbery convictions and it also served time for assault in 2005. While most of the crimes on today's list didn't exactly require top-tier detective work to solve, you'd be hard-pressed to find something more open and shut than this next story. It all started in early May of 2020, when representatives from England's Devon and Cornwall police shared the details of a recent drug bust. It had started when officers had stopped a white van which was headed into Devon along the M5 motorway. It's unclear if the vehicle was specifically being pulled over on suspicion of drug activity, or whether this was supposed to be a simple traffic stop. But what we do know is that when police walked up to speak to the driver, they got quite the surprise. The vehicle's interior was covered with cocaine. About $30,000 worth of it, authorities estimated. According to police, upon seeing that he was being pulled over, the driver of the van knew that he was in serious trouble if officers found the sizable quantity of drugs that he was carrying. In a last-ditch effort to save himself, he had hurled the entire brick of cocaine out one of his windows. Well, he had tried to anyway. In the heat of the moment, he had forgotten to actually open the window, so it's probably more accurate to say that he threw the drugs at the window instead. This had had the combined effect of partially shattering the pane of glass while also ripping open the bag and sending white powder flying around everywhere inside. Needless to say, the resulting scene did not engender the kind of plausible deniability you would want if you were going to try and convince the police that these were in fact not your drugs. The driver was subsequently arrested, though his name was not released to the public.
On the night of March 7th, 2021, police in the city of Natchez, Mississippi, got quite the unusual call about an alleged burglary at a local elementary school. The call itself wasn't the unusual part. Rather, it was the caller. He was the one who had broken into the school, but now he was stuck and couldn't get out. When police and firefighters arrived at the scene shortly before 9 p.m., they apparently found the caller, 19-year-old Willie Dobbins, just as he had described. He was suspended from the ceiling in the cafeteria at Fraser Elementary. According to reports, he had tried to break in through the roof of the school in order to get to a room where money was kept, but had somehow got himself completely snared in the process. Fortunately for Dobbins, firefighters were able to rescue him from the place where he was dangling, and he only sustained a few scrapes and bruises from the whole ordeal. Unfortunately for Dobbins, he was arrested and charged with felony burglary. While it's unclear what the status of the case currently is, it appears that Dobbins was released sometime after being booked on the burglary charge. We know this because according to the Adams County Sheriff's Office, he was booked again on grand larceny of a motor vehicle just last month. Unfortunately, there is currently no word on whether he called the cops on himself in that case as well. On the evening of March 24, 2009, 51-year-old Craig Aylesworth got into a fight with his neighbor in the community of Bithlow, Florida. While reports don't mention what the dispute was about, they do mention what happened next. Like any reasonable person, Craig talked things out in a calm and respectful manner, and him and his neighbor actually developed a close friendship that they maintain to this day. Oh, sorry, no, it looks like I read that wrong. According to sources from the time, Craig reportedly grabbed a glass bottle and some gasoline, made a Molotov cocktail, and threw the lit firebomb at his neighbor's travel trailer. Unfortunately for the 51-year-old, he didn't quite get the last laugh, as the wind soon changed direction, causing the fire to spread back towards his own property. By the time firefighters arrived at the scene and extinguished the blaze, the flames had reportedly consumed his own travel trailer, a shed, and two cars and a pickup truck that also belonged to him. To top it all off, Craig was arrested and slapped with three arson charges, as well as discharge of a destructive device. The following year, he was sentenced to 11 years and three months in prison for the crime. On December 15, 2010, a group of burglars thought that they had hit the jackpot after breaking into a home in the community of Silver Spring Shores, Florida. In addition to about $1,500 worth of jewelry, a laptop, a Blu-ray player, and a 42-inch flat-screen television, the thieves came across what they were sure was a stash of illegal drugs. They were in bags inside three important-looking boxes, and the group guessed that they were filled with either crushed pills or cocaine. After grabbing all three of the boxes and adding them to their haul, the criminals took off, ostensibly delighted with their good luck. A short time later, homeowner Holly Tenkza arrived back at her residence to find the place had been ransacked. The criminals had taken a large number of her valuables, which was a significant blow because she didn't have renter's insurance. That wasn't all, though. Her biggest concern by far was what had happened to the three boxes that normally sat on her bookshelf. Inside were the cremated ashes of her father, as well as those of her two recently deceased Great Danes. These were the same boxes that the burglars had mistaken for drugs. Unaware of the mix-up, the thieves had stomach-churningly gone on to both snort and taste the ashes several times. Even after the powder didn't seem to have the desired effect they were after, they apparently still held on to the belief that they were in possession of drugs. It wasn't until one of them allegedly read a newspaper article that was reporting on the burglary that they realized that they had in fact consumed the cremated remains of a man and two dogs. Instead of trying to give the stolen ashes back, however, they dumped the two boxes in a nearby lake. These were later recovered by police and returned to Holly, who was extremely grateful that they had been found. 
Unfortunately, the last box containing one of the dog's ashes was reportedly never recovered. Around the same time that the ashes were found, officers from the Marion County Sheriff's Department arrested all five of the suspects involved in the burglary. Two of them were minors, while the three others were identified as 19-year-old Waldo Saroa, 19-year-old Jose Diaz Marrero, and 18-year-old Matrix Andaluz. It turned out that they were all repeat offenders who had been involved in a number of similar burglaries in the area. The following year, all of them would be convicted of various charges, with Saroa receiving five years in prison, Diaz Marrero receiving eight, and Andaluz receiving nine. As ridiculous as this story is, though, amazingly, Soroa, Diaz Marrero, and Andaluz are apparently not alone. In November of 2014, a trio of thieves in St. Peter's, Missouri, also stole a box of human ashes during a burglary. While they likewise disgustingly tasted the ashes, they were apparently a little quicker to catch on to their mistake, though, and threw the box out of the window of their getaway car immediately afterwards. At about 8.45 on the morning of April 20th, 2020, officers from Manitoba's Winnipeg Police Service received a call about a violent carjacking. The 68-year-old victim was found lying in a back lane near Bannerman Avenue and Charles Street and was suffering from serious injuries. He told police that he had been getting into his car when he was approached by two suspects, who he described as a young man and woman. The pair had confronted him hit him with an unknown object, and pulled him out of the car. They had then run him over with his own vehicle while fleeing the scene. As the victim was sent to the hospital in unstable condition, police began to search the area for the two suspects. They were spotted less than an hour later driving the stolen vehicle about two miles west. However, the female suspect, who was behind the wheel at the time, refused to pull over and sped off. A chase ensued, but by the time officers caught up, all they could find was the empty stolen vehicle. It had been left abandoned in Winnipeg's Riverbend neighborhood, roughly three miles north of the original crime scene. While police were still determined to find the suspects, they got an unexpected bit of help just after noon that same day, when a resident called them back to Riverbend with an unusual report. There was a young woman trapped inside a garbage bin calling for help. Sure enough, when officers returned to the scene, they found the woman as described. She was the carjacking suspect that they had been looking for, and had gotten trapped in the bin while hiding from police after the vehicle chase. According to reports, she even still had the stolen car keys with her. She was arrested and charged with robbery, aggravated assault, dangerous operation of a conveyance, flight while pursued by a peace officer, and operation of a conveyance while prohibited by order under criminal code. Because she was only 16 years old, her name was not released publicly. The same couldn't be said for her 24-year-old accomplice, Tad Wayne Ivan Cook. Cook was arrested nearly a year later in February of 2021, thanks to DNA evidence in the case. He was already in custody for a different offense by the time and was subsequently charged with robbery and aggravated assault in connection with the previous year's carjacking. While few additional details about the 68-year-old victim in the case were released, according to a tweet at the time from the Winnipeg chief of police, he managed to pull through, and after some lengthy rehab, was able to leave the hospital and continue his recovery at home. On the morning of March 27, 2009, John Comparetto was innocently finishing up his business in a men's hotel bathroom in Swatara Township, Pennsylvania, when things took an abrupt and violent turn. As he walked out of the stall he was in, suddenly, he had a gun in his face. The weapon was being held by 19-year-old Jerome Marcus Blanchett, who reportedly said, quote, Give me your money or I'll kill you. When John handed over his wallet and cell phone as the gunman demanded, he was further instructed to pull down his pants. Before running from the bathroom, Blanchett once again threatened John, saying that he would also be killed if he tried to follow him. While many of us might have complied with this demand, 
John wasn't intimidated by Blanchett or his weapon. In fact, the second the 19-year-old fled the bathroom, John reached down towards his ankle holster and recovered a firearm of his own. You see, John was a retired police lieutenant with the NYPD. Just seconds after Blanchett was out of the bathroom, John was already out in the hotel lobby chasing the teenage gunman as he ran towards the exit. However, this wasn't the only surprise waiting for Blanchett. Not only had he just robbed a retired cop at gunpoint, but the hotel where he had chosen to commit the crime was in the middle of hosting a police convention. The place was currently swarming with more than 300 narcotics officers from Pennsylvania and Ohio. As if all of this weren't ridiculous enough, it turned out that Blanchett hadn't even bothered to sort out a proper getaway vehicle prior to the armed robbery. When John caught up to him, weapon drawn, he was reportedly sitting in a taxi outside of the hotel, still trying to get the driver to leave. Needless to say, the situation attracted quite a bit of attention from several of the other officers who were there that day, especially when Blanchett tried to make a run for it a second time after being confronted by John Comparetto. He didn't make it very far, though, before two of these officers, Patrolman Thomas Kolesny and Sergeant Matt Stash from the Wilkes Bar Police, tackled him to the ground and placed him under arrest. Understandably, news of the botched crime quickly made its way into local headlines. In statements to the media, John recounted the incident, saying that he had been robbed by, quote, probably the dumbest criminal in Pennsylvania. According to reports, Blanchett was already awaiting trial for four previous robbery charges at the time of his arrest. Being caught so many times had apparently done nothing to harm the 19-year-old's ego, however, as when asked for comment following a subsequent bail hearing, he reportedly replied, quote, I'm smooth. The latest available records we could find state that Blanchett is currently incarcerated at SCI Houtsdale in Clearfield County, Pennsylvania. In June of 2010, officers from Alberta's Calgary Police Service were called to the scene of a burglary. The place looked like it had been hit pretty hard. Windows were smashed, the place had been ransacked, and everything of value, from jewelry to electronics, appeared to be missing. The victims, a young woman and her boyfriend, were devastated. Through sobs, the woman said that she had lost everything, though after taking an inventory, managed to hand over a list that she had written of everything she thought had specifically been stolen. Soon after, she received a call from her father in Quebec and proceeded to explain the situation to him in French. However, rather than repeating what she had just told police, the woman reportedly explained that the whole thing was a massive fraud. She said that she and her boyfriend had hidden their valuables, had smashed the windows themselves, and had even planted fake footprints of the so-called burglars for police to find. The whole thing was just a scam for the insurance money. As the woman brazenly explained all of this on the phone, she paid no attention to the one officer who was in earshot, 37-year-old Constable Chiranjit Maharu, obviously believing that he couldn't understand what she was saying. To her horror, however, by the time she had finished the call, Maharu had taken ten pages of notes about the scam, after which he turned to her and simply said, Merci beaucoup. For all the non-French speakers out there, that translates to, thank you very much. As Maharu would later joke in an interview with the media, quote, she didn't expect a brown guy to speak French. Unfortunately for the woman, she had seriously underestimated Maharu. It turned out that French was actually one of seven languages he spoke, in addition to English, Punjabi, Hindi, Urdu, Arabic, and Gujarati. Not only that, he had previously lived in Quebec for more than 10 years after first emigrating to Canada from India in 1995. In 2006, Maharu had given up a high-paying private sector job in Montreal to move to Calgary and join the police force. Being an officer and serving the community had been a childhood dream of his. This was apparently far from the only time his language skills had come in handy since joining the force. 
During an interview with local media, one of his colleagues spoke about a particularly notable incident in which Maharu helped to resolve a situation they were called to where a landlord was in a dispute with a tenant. The landlord spoke Urdu and the tenant spoke Arabic, and Maharu was able to translate both sides of the exchange. While it appears that the woman and her boyfriend allegedly behind the 2010 insurance scam were never publicly identified by name, reports from the Times state that they were arrested and that she was charged with mischief. As for Maharu, he reportedly kept up his stellar police work and went on to receive a crime prevention award from the province of Alberta two years later. On June 20th, 2012, a man was driving in Prince George's County, Maryland, when he noticed red and white flashing lights behind him. However, rather than coming from a police cruiser, the lights were in a white pickup truck and had simply been placed in the vehicle's windshield. Still, it was obvious that the pickup driver wanted the man to pull over, so he did as requested, stopping on Route 301 near Trade Zone Avenue in Upper Marlboro. When he did, he was approached by a young man, later identified as 29-year-old Anthony Kenneth Mastro Giovanni, who explained that he had pulled him over because he was speeding. It was at that point that the driver informed Mastro Giovanni that he was in fact an off-duty officer from Maryland's Capitol Heights Police Department, and that he would need to see some credentials. Immediately, Mastro Giovanni's demeanor changed though he still claimed that he was a military police officer from Louisiana. The off-duty cop explained that this didn't matter. First of all, he didn't have jurisdiction here, and second of all, the lights he was using on his truck were illegal in the state of Maryland. That's when Mastro Giovanni fled the scene. He didn't make it far, however, and was soon arrested by local police. It turned out that the 29-year-old was actually a Navy reservist from just a few miles north in Crofton. Unfortunately, it's here that the case takes an extremely dark turn. You see, while it's unclear whether Master Giovanni was ultimately charged for impersonating a police officer, it turned out that this was far from the first time he had abused his military credentials. In fact, for more than half a decade, he had been using his involvement in civic organizations and his military affiliations to systematically abuse male juveniles and manufacture CP. During a raid of one of the places he was staying, authorities recovered hard drives containing over 30,000 illegal images and videos, as well as hidden camera and video transmitting equipment. In September of 2013, Mastro Giovanni was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Inmate records reveal that he is currently locked up at a federal facility in Beaumont, Texas, and is scheduled to be released in 2033. On the evening of June 5, 2016, two men burst into a McDonald's at a shopping center in Besançon, a city in eastern France not far from the border with Switzerland. After firing a warning shot in the air with a shotgun to show the staff they meant business, the two armed robbers demanded that they hand over all of the cash from the registers. The terrified employees did as they were told and gave the men the equivalent of about $2,300 US. As the robbers headed for the restaurant's exit, it must have seemed like a successful heist. However, little did they know, they were already in a supersized McHeap of trouble. You see, of the roughly 40 total patrons in the fast food establishment at the time, 11 were members of a French paramilitary special forces unit known by the acronym GIGN. Though the military officers were off-duty at the time, they were still armed, and let's just say, they didn't take too kindly to having their dinner interrupted. In order to avoid putting any additional lives in danger, the Special Forces members waited patiently while the two men carried out the robbery. It was only after one of them tripped while on their way out the door that they pounced. Immediately, the man who fell was apprehended by several of the military officers while the others surrounded his accomplice. When he refused to drop his weapon and decided to further push his luck by pointing the gun at one of the Special Forces members, he was promptly shot in the stomach 
and also taken down. While neither of the names of the suspects were publicly released, reports at the time identified them both as being in their early 20s. After being taken to the hospital for treatment, both men were slapped with armed robbery charges. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a minute to thank our amazing supporters over on Patreon. As many of you are aware, our situation on YouTube always seems to be a bit uncertain, but our patrons help to ensure that we can continue to make content like this long term without having to worry as much about what surprises might be thrown our way. Plus, patrons also get access to four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. If you'd like to help support the channel directly, head over to patreon.com slash crimezone to join. You can also find that link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and take care.